Welcome everyone to our second show in our interview series. Terry Lee is my name. I am manager of Tartan Town Limited and have been doing that for many years. We are enjoying checking in with friends of mine and, and uh, seeing what they're up to, how they're coping during these times and what's going on for them. Today it's top pipe band drummers around the world. They're friends, as I say, and uh, we'll be checking in and see how they're getting on with things. Today it's Stephen McWhorter, Tyler Fry, and Reed Maxwell. This is a four charity event. I've asked all our guests to nominate a charity and Tartantown will support that charity as well as our own charity, which happens to be foodbankscanada.ca. These will be posted on the videos when you see them. Once again, my good buddy, Neil Dickey is back to help me through the interview process. And he's with us today and let's see if we can welcome him in now. Neil, how are you? Good. I, I like to shade of blue than you. Well, that, very well done. We should have coordinated perhaps in advance, but we do <laughs> our best. Have matching top and town golf shops. I know. We should do that, <laughs> huh? <laughs> Great to have you back. Uh, our first guest today is Stephen McWhorter. Uh, for me, uh, when I think of Stephen, I think of great times at SFU, and I think about great times he's having now at Inverary and District. Uh, super happy for how he did with us and how he's doing with, with IDPB, and uh, things are great for him. I know that you know, you'll probably run by some stats with, with Stephen. He's won the World Solos you know, 10 years uh, overall, and that's, that's fantastic. But for Is that me, a record? I think he's approaching the record. He could probably clarify that. But I think for me, it's more about that for Stephen. And I, I look at Stephen McWhorter, and I, what I see is, is musicality and a person that's interested in pipe band music and wants to drive the movement forward. And if, this is why I think separates Stephen from some others. I happen to have a great drummer in my past who was very interested in music. But Stephen and Stuart are a great combination. And I think that's what interests me about Stephen, how fantastic the combination is. Uh, let's welcome in Stephen McWhorter now, I think from Glasgow, Scotland. Stephen, Hi, welcome, well, welcome and thanks so much for doing this today. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, appreciate it, appreciate it. You're, you're doing this for charity today and your charity is Canadian Mental Health Association. That will appear on the screen at some point. I wanna first ask about family, Stephen. Who makes up your family these days? Uh, a very, uh, a very understanding wife, Grace. <laughs> of course. Uh, and I've got a six-year-old boy, Harry, and a four-year-old girl, Maggie. Which Perfect. She's four, forty-one, on fourteen. <laughs> Quite Tis good. the way. Yes. Yes, it is. That sounds really fantastic. Um, St uh, Stephen, during your time here in Vancouver. Were there any highlights that stick out with SFU? Um, you lost too, too many highlights to actually pinpoint one, I think. Um, I was actually just talking to, I was just talking to Derek Cooper today, actually, about the time we, uh, we played the, the old medley at Coquitlam Highland Games because we, we had to draw on the line that we didn't know about until we arrived at the games. Um, that medley is actually a, a kind of a standout performance during the, the time in the band because it was just so unexpected that we would draw the old medley and it was a, a great performance. Um, right. Probably the I uh, the last the last medley at the Worlds in two thousand and eight was was pretty special. Just the the amount of work that went into that medley from the whole the whole team was was great. It was just like the first first which, which one which one was that. What, what what was the opener of the Terry's favorite tune, the Cosmos Cascade? Ah, okay. The one that Reed did not like initially. I had to talk him into it. Yeah. So I think he doesn't like it. <laughs> I think you're right. But it finished on Mrs. Makado Rase, kind of a yeah. version of it. Yeah, took a while. Sure. You're right that these these things took a while to put together. I recall working on Mrs. Makado Rase for a long time and being one of the more rewarding things that I was part of was that journey on that tune. It was lots of fun. I, I remember listening to it. It went on a long time too. I know. <laughs> we couldn't decide which parts to chat. You, you played it like 
he played it like eight different ways in a 50 second space of time at the end. <laughs> I'm sure Stephen has that that feeling now. It's hard to sometimes finish medleys, right? There's so many great ideas. There's got to be a thousand ways you can end it, right, Stephen? Yeah, it's, uh, it's easy to let a medley run on too long at the end when you have yes. so many good ideas. You, you want to try and do them all, but. I know. I'm glad Stuart makes the final decision on that kind of stuff. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad that the ball's in his court there. I, I think answer. in your 2019 medley at Inverary, uh, Stephen, it, it seemed to me you guys had like a false ending. It, in the middle of the medley, there was like, it was built up like an ending and then it went on and continued on. Is that right? Yeah, a, a lot of people a lot of people felt that. Um not necessarily people on the band, but definitely, definitely people that listened to it and gave us feedback had the same the same thoughts as yourself. But well, mine is positive. I thought it was a great effect. I thought it was a yeah. Nice... It's, it's really hard though. Whenever you're, whenever you put a medley together over the winter and you become really attached to it, it's it's hard to sometimes step step back from it and and look at it look at it as a as a one time sell on on a listener. Um, see, uh, it's pretty difficult. And sometimes you need, a, you need a break from it. You need to walk away and not hear it for a while and then come back. You know, you get too inside it. You're absolutely right. You know, it's exactly true when, when you're writing, when I'm writing on my own. If yep. I'm not sure about something, I'll leave it for two, three weeks and not even try and think about it and then come back, work on other things or something like that and then come back and you got a fresh absolutely. perspective. For sure. Uh, Stephen, we also have a commercial connection in that we sell your drumsticks, which seem to be going very well. How's that going for you? And is there anything in the pipeline there at all, product-wise? Uh, yeah, sticks are going well. Uh, lots, lots of good feedback about them. Um, nothing, nothing new in the pipeline at the moment. Um, okay. Just everything's, everything's just shut down. So it's, uh, everything's ground to a halt, basically. Great. And I know you take online students and this and that. We'll put a link up on the on the video showing how people can reach you and all that. And speaking of recordings, you've done a couple of recordings for us. And first up, we have the super cool fanfare, which all pipe bands would like to hear, you know, uh, what I call drum gymnastics. And, and uh, this one's called International Connection. It's got a bit of everything. It's fantastic. And after the video, you'll, you'll carry on, hopefully, with a little interview from Neil. Watch Oot is only, my only advice there. But uh, let's take a look at Stephen's fanfare video now.
right, we're back. I've, I've changed my position so that light shines upon me, not un from underneath me. <laughs> Hi, Stephen. Welcome to this wee segment of the broadcast. How are you doing, Neil? Not too bad. I think um, we did some uh, a bunch of interviews before with uh, Jack Lee, Stuart Little, and Bruce Gandy, and I learned a couple of things. One from a review is that I have to talk slower, and you're got your accent, so you and I have to talk as if we're like on Radio 2 or something, okay? <laughs> I also learned from Peter Jennings that, you know, if you pull down, sit on the back of your shirt, then, you know, you get, you know, you get a good look. And I had mosquito bites <laughs> on my leg the last time. And when I was doing this, that is not a good look on a camera. <laughs> so no hands, nothing like that. Let's just talk. Anyway, I loved that wee fanfare. That was brilliant. I, I especially liked the set you know, with the SFU picture in the background, you know, a certain amount of suck up is lovely. <laughs> but the the whiskey, the barrel beside you with a is it tanker agent in there or? Yeah, there's a there's a few gins, a few whiskeys. Yeah. Um, aye, could be quite. <laughs> that, that, that was my Christmas present from uh, Grace this year, last year. Ah, what the gin or the barrel? The barrel. Oh, okay. <laughs> so listen, let's talk for a minute about. Um, your fanfare highlighted some of your um, technique and uh, clearly you must be one of the best technical drummers and one of the, uh, for me you have some, you know, the single most clarity in, in your rudimentary work and stuff like that. But that technique just doesn't come out of thin air. Tell us how you, that developed, like where you began, I know you began as a techno drummer, but after that, how is it your technique has become so precise? Um, I, I really think it's just a, a really good foundation um, from my first proper, my first proper teacher. I mean, my, my dad started me uh, with bits and pieces, and uh, you know, a few other people gave me a, a little bit here and there, but it wasn't until I went to to Adrian High um, in 1994. The summer of that? Uh, it was just before I started high school, so I was um, 12. Uh, 12. Um, <clears throat> so, the. Um, sorry. Is that Grace? That was, was Grace throwing the charger in in case my iPad dies, but it's all good. Okay. Uh, yeah, so, so I started in 1994 with Adrian at his, at his class. Um, and right from the, the outset, he was very much, um, very much a stickler for detail. Um, I I become I become obsessed with drumming really quickly. Like I just I just knew that's what I wanted to do. And basically, if you know, if Adrian told me to jump six feet in the air, I would have jumped eight feet for him. Um, but you know, he, he always led by example. Like when he when he talked about practice, that you could see that he was putting in the hours as well. So you just wanted, I just wanted to emulate everything he was doing. Um, when, when you were a wee boy, were you around pipe bands as a wee boy, or did you see other bands and stuff with drums in it? Uh, there was a pipe band competition in, in my local village every year, um, and that was, you know, that was in the the 90s whenever every band in Northern Ireland played every competition. So you had, you know, you had Film Marshall, uh, the RUC, Monkstein Mosley, Rivara, you know, you had all the, you had all the big bands in grade, grade one and two playing every year. So, uh, so as a wee boy, did you, at the competitions on the tuning part, did you go to the back of the band or the front of the band to listen? Um, I actually used to sit. They used to have a at that particular competition. They used to have a like a lorry that you could sit in, and right at the grade one circle. So I used to sit in that and just watch the competition. Uh, I would have a walk around the drum corps and then go go sit and watch the whole contest. So, so then you moved on to what what band did you spend your your formative years at? So, from nineteen ninety five through to the 2001 Worlds, I played with Kali Baki. Um, with Adrian what grade I, did they begin in when you were starting? I, I remember grade, them as a grade two band. Yeah, grade two, yeah. I went straight into grade two. Um, but we, you know, 
my first year we played with four snare drummers. Then the next year we brought in another three young players. And every year we just kept bringing in new young players and it, it just kind of built up. Uh, in 2001, we won the, the Drummer at the Worlds in grade two. Um, and then that's whenever I decided to, to move to SFU. Reed, Reed called me and asked me if I wanted to come play. And I wasn't actually going to do it, to be honest. Did you have other offers? No. No, okay. but I was, I was doing an apprenticeship at the time in coach building. And I just, I don't know why I thought this is too big a move. Like it seems, the, the world seemed like a really big place at that time. And yeah. uh, it was actually my mum said to me, she says, you know, if you, don't, if you don't go play with them, I'll never forgive you. <laughs> so she kind of guilted me into it. So I went she just to wanted the extra room in the house for a lodger. Hi, uh-huh, probably. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so you're playing at a young age with Cully Bahey. And um, when did you start doing, well, let me preface this, this solo thing, because you, you, live, you were over here in North America for quite a bit. Uh, here, the Highland Games, um, you have your solo events in the morning, and there's, there's drumming, there's tenor drumming, there's piping, and then there's a, a wee break, and then we go into the pipe band stuff. And if memory serves me correct, I don't remember that format existing in Britain or Ireland ever. Did, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Um... In, in the Northern Ireland scene where I grew up, there used to be uh, used to be a couple of local solo competitions, and usually in March or April, and then the Ulster Solo Championships um, around that time, and then the solo season would break, and it, the band season would go right up until the week after the Worlds. So now, um, you, sorry to interrupt. Now you've got the World Solos every year. What time of year is it usually? Uh, it's usually the third third Saturday in October. Now, um, nowadays, you, you then don't have any com- competition preparation, really, because there's not that many solo drumming competitions around, right? Yeah, that's right. Although they have started to bring in the, uh, the, the, qualifying, the qualifying rounds. Uh, I think there's five, four or five events now. Or the top four of qualifying to the semi final. Um, so you you go right to the semis as the the former winner. No, no, ever it's a f- f- clean slate every year. Everybody has to qualify for the semi. Okay. Uh, so it's obviously this year was a bit of a write off, but last year I qualified from the Metro Cup in New York. And the year before, I didn't. I, I was every competition was booked up, just with different workshops and stuff. So I played all. I played every round that that day, which I quite enjoyed. What, to be honest. Was, what, what was the qualifying of, events from around the world then to get you into the world solos? There's one in North America, the Metro Cup, uh, yeah. Glasgow and West of Scotland, L and B. Um, Lothian and Borders. Lothian and Borders. There's the Kingdom Thistle one in Fife. And the Ulster Solos in Northern Ireland. And so if you qualify one of them, it gets you into what round? The semi-final. Okay. So when did you start going to the World Solos? At what age? Uh, 1996 was my first, first solo. So I was 13. In professional? No, 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 no. Okay. Uh, that, that was in the under 15. Okay, no, I'm in the professional. When did you bring oh, in the professional bed? Uh, so the first year I played there was 2002. So you've been playing every year, 17 world championships? Yeah. And you've won 10 of them? Yeah. Is that a record? I believe so, yeah. Well, well, very well done. I believe so. so. How does your preparation for that work? I mean, I think at this stage in your career, nerves isn't going to be a factor, is it? Or does it still play a part for you? Oh, man. Huge factor. Yeah? Huge factor. I think if you ask any, any performer in any sport or, you know, it doesn't matter. If they don't get nervous, I think they're, they're lying. You need, yeah. you need the nerves to... 
take your performance to the next level. It's just how you manage it, I think, is the difference. What, what role what role does the accompanying piper play for you? Like I, I know you played a few times with Stuart. I think you played with Ali a couple of times, right? Yeah. Uh, the, the piper's huge. Absolutely. Yep. It's, it's massive. I've played most of them with Stuart, um, which is, you know, it's so easy to play with. Um, we just think very much the same. Um, I played one with Ali Henderson, our pipe surgeon. I played one with Callum Beaumont. One with Matt Wilson, the pipe, pipe surgeon of Phil Marshall. And two with Daniel McDermott. He's played the last two. Just a, a piper in our band. Young guy and absolutely, you know, mad keen to play for the drum. And how much preparation between you and the piper? When do you, what rehearsals do you do? Do you hang around after band practice or something? Or you get, try and get three or four no. in? No, because there's the rest of it isn't band practice at that time of the year. We used to take a break until after the solos. Okay. Um, so, yeah, we... We used to get together about maybe maybe two weekends before the solos, just for a, a Saturday or a Sunday, and have a run through and make some recordings. And then I go away and listen to them. He goes away and listens to them, and uh, and then the weekend before the solos, and then maybe two two times the week of. Um, I think you know we we played together enough now that we we kind of just quickly. After the first the first run through, blow the cobwebs off, and we're both listening to the recordings all the time of the performance, so kind of analyze it on our own. And okay, so before this is a, give, brings us into the next section quite neatly, but before we get there, I want to just mention something that um, when I talked to the pipers in the last edition of the show, uh, I talked to the practicing, and Jack uses videos a lot now. Uh, we used to use mirrors. Do you like critique yourself in a video, or do you just? Look, you're looking down. How do you correct yourself? Yeah, uh, video, uh, mirror. Uh, I have a mirror in my drumming room here. Um, <clears throat> that's key because, you know, sometimes you think you're relaxed, but when you watch a video back, you, you actually see that there's a bit of tension or your posture's not quite right. Or Because I teach all the time as well, I kind of worry sometimes that I'll, I'll become one of those teachers that, you know, says all the right things, but maybe doesn't do them just because you get lazy. And so, you okay, so here's, here's something I've noticed. And I don't know if Grace has done this to you or it's your own self critique, but the, back in the day, you used to talk your way through all your drumming, even in the band and stuff. And you, your mouth was moving a lot. And I noticed in that little fanfare, you, you've gotten that out. You, you're, not, you're not speaking to your drum anymore. I remember, I don't know who the drummer was, but he used to talk as he played and we could, you could hear him over the pipe and he was like, <laughs> as he was playing. So you're like, not that bad, but you got rid of the little mouth thing. So you've relaxed your jaw as well as your shoulders. It's very good. <laughs> so listen, talking of, talking of Daniel, we've got a wee video here that you're playing. Do uh, you want to give us a, an introduction to it? To tell us the tunes that you're doing. Yeah. Um, whenever Terry asked me about, the, about putting a wee set together, I, I really didn't know what to do. Um, but I thought because the because the pre Worlds concert wasn't going ahead this year, I would uh, play a couple of new tunes that, that, that the band's playing or w was going to play at the concert. First one's an old veil tune called Kenny the Sparrow Man, and the second one's uh, we just call it the South African jig because it was written by some guy from South Africa, and I'm not sure of his name. It's called Café Remy. Um, so I, it's, it's a really good tune, I think. Yeah, it might be I, Scott Macaulay. Not the Canadian Scott Macaulay, the, the South African one. Yeah, um, no idea. Hopefully the okay. composer is self-known. And who's the um, third one written by? None other than yourself, Neil. I thought I would uh, give a, a wee waltz uh, version by Alan Tully of your uh, your famous clumsy lover. Okay. It's been a big tune for the band. It's been it's been quite a, a signature tune of the band over the years. I think so. It's uh, I thought it was quite apt. Well, I appreciate it. Thanks very much. Let's have a look at the video. Bye, Quick. 
All right, well that was uh, fantastic. Uh, nice wee set of tunes. I like the, the overlay of uh, Daniel and you, kind of uh, one for the millennium. Listen, I want to talk to you about, um, you know, we talked about the solo stuff, so a wee bit now about being a pipe band drummer. It's particularly about being a lead drummer because you've risen to the top in that field as well. And one of the things I saw very early on was your sensitivity to the music and um, the, how like you're able to sing any tune in the medley and that's a rare thing among drummers and you seem to have an understanding of how the music works is that is that a consequence of working with pipe majors like in the beginning like terry and now with stuart or is it something that's just developed because you have an eclectic taste in music anyway um i think it's just a i think it's mainly just because i love I love pipe music. Um, I love pipe band music. That's that's the only music I, I've listened to through, from I was about I don't know twelve years old till 
my late teenage years. Like, I was a complete pipe band geek. Um, it was it's ridiculous actually. Like some of the stuff, some of the some of the things I can tell you about world recordings is silly. Well, tell us a silly thing about world recordings. Oh, I couldn't even think of one off the top of my head, but. I used to be able to just tell who the band was and what year from the, the intro roles and the attack. Yeah. It was just, uh, it was just ridiculous. I, I remember when they, they used to do the CDs, I would listen to them to, in the car and at home until they were worn out, you know. Yeah. And do you find yourself going back to the BBC to the live stream thing to look at previous worlds in the last couple of years? No. You, you haven't done that? That's a cool thing to do, is to go back and look at the videos. Yeah. <laughs> It probably is. I miss the CDs, if I'm being honest. Yeah. Uh, I miss just what what you hear from just listening. Uh, sometimes when you when you watch a video, you don't you, you don't hear it the same way. Like you were yeah. you were forced to really listen to what was going on on the CDs. So so you don't honestly don't listen to much more than pipe band music. That's what's in your car and in your 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 iTunes and all that. No, I listen to more music now than what than what I did. Um, more than pipe bands now, but yeah, I've got. I don't have any particular kind of music that I like. If something catches me here, I'll. If a song catches me here, I'll probably buy the album, um, and listen to that for a while until I get sick of it or I hear something else. And then, yeah, I'm just. I can be quite quite fixated on something for a short space of time and then move on. So, how about drumming? The um, do you pick up? ideas or get, learn new things from other styles of drumming i'm thinking like um uh, i don't know gene gene krupa or like jazz drummers or the what's the, the swiss the secret police or whatever they're called you know uh, uh, top secret. the top secret yeah like yeah. is that actually a factor in what you like how is their technique compared to pipe band drumming is it on par or is it different um the top secret for example, is more about the uh, the coordination and the vi the visual coordination of, of what what they're actually playing. Technically, is probably not as as technical as what we do, uh, and with less intricacies in it. Um, I think it's the it's the attention to detail in pipe band drumming that makes it so so tricky. Um, it's uh, you know maybe. Jazz drumming probably is on a par with pipe band drumming from a technical standpoint and a subtlety standpoint. Um, that, it's the subtlety of it to, to really make the music is, is the hard part. So it, would you ever, um, I think brave is the wrong adjective, but would you ever like be brave enough to put an element like that into a competition performance like a little bit of a visual thing or is it a, re a moot point you don't need any visuals and it's all about the listening um i think of the i think of the visual mix musical sense then yeah then i've got no issue with that I, you know what i mean i know how does a visual make musical sense but if it suits the mood of the music at that particular time then yeah absolutely like any of your sticks like that or something they're putting your <laughs> head <laughs> so no. which brings me to the, the the last little thing i want to talk to you about was if they change the formation in the, the championships to a concert formation would, would you think you would have the freedom to, to do a little bit more of that visual stuff like what's your thoughts on that would you like to see us not playing circles anymore absolutely concert formation all the way and, and what's the benefit of that I just think it. Uh, I think it'll provide more freedom musically. Uh, I think. I think it'll take a little bit of the. Uh, I don't know. It'll not be quite as sterile an environment to play in. I think when you go to the circle, once you get to the circle, it's it's very serious. I think when you're in a concert formation, everything's a bit more relaxed and. It's all about producing the music at that point. It's less about not making a mistake and trying to win. Uh, and really, that's, that's what we're trying to do. Is. So it, um, the, the other thing, you and I have talked in the past about this, but um, 
there's a certain frustration uh, in the Marshall Spain and Real format of the, the, the competitions now that we constantly hear, and there's nothing wrong with them, like the big tunes like Lord Alexander Kennedy and Highland Wedding and um, whatever, Links of Forth, all of those ones are brilliant tunes, but I think we've been super saturated with them. Like, wh why is it that those tunes are played so repetitively and is there any remedy for this? I think I think bands just go to those tunes because they know that adjudicators don't have to think about what's coming next in the tune musically. It's easy to it's easy to judge because it's so well known. Sometimes when you play a tune that's that's maybe not as well known, it's one more thing that you know one more thing to think about and not as easy to not as easy to separate. It bands out with, uh, you know, playing music that you're not as familiar with. So what would you do? Like, if you could propose something, if you, if you had a podium at the RSPBA meeting one time, and you say, ladies and uh, gentlemen, my proposal is this, what would it be? Uh, I'm a huge, I'm a huge fan of the, I'm a huge fan of the set list of tunes for Peabrook every year. Mm -hmm. I would... I would uh, propose a, a set list of March to Spain real tunes that you have to submit a new MSR from every year. So you can keep where, your big Where would that list come from? From the pipe majors and drum sergeants of the bands competing? Or a committee or something? Probably a committee, I think. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, you can't, you can't play the same tune can't play the same MSR within a, I don't know, five year span or something. You can still have your other MSR made up of your, you know, Clan McRae, Susan McLeod and whatever, whatever. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. But that's got to be a qualifying set. And yep. when you play, you play the final, it's got to be your four part of MSR. Well, that's um, really interesting. All right, listen, Stephen, Terry's going to come back in. Um, but I, I like to end up with a couple of quick fires. <clears throat> right? So this is where you don't have to think. You just answer. You know, I've got them written down even. All right. What's your favorite meal to eat in a restaurant? And then? Anything Indian? Uh, Sit and then garlic chicken. <laughs> okay. What's your favorite home cooked meal? Ooh. Uh, lasagna. Madonna or Lady Gaga? Lady Gaga. See, and you said you don't listen to other music. Who's your favorite uh, Disney character? Pocahontas. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. If you could go on a vacation, do you go to the beach or the mountains? Mountains, I hate the sand. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> if you could spend anywhere, like on the coronavirus lockdown, except at home, like, where would it be? With you and your family, the whole thing? I don't know. Somewhere in the Caribbean, probably. Yeah. And what what's the best binging show you've seen lately? What would you binged on? Uh, the Last Dance, Michael Jordan. Amazing. Oh, how did you like that? Uh, it was fantastic. Yeah. yeah fantastic. Well, but it, it, it spoke to your competitive spirit, eh? <laughs> All right. Big time. <laughs> All right, well, then we're going to bring Terry in. Um, we, we didn't talk too much about Ensemble, but I know that's very close to your heart. And um, playing with Reed Maxwell for all those years, you, you kind of failed to develop an appreciation for how important Ensemble is in the pipe band thing. Um, we're going to play one of your favourite uh, medleys with Inverary uh, right now. But maybe speak to that, like why you, this is one of your favourites from an Ensemble point of view. Uh, this is the medley from the the worlds last year. Um, I just everything everything about the medley was relatively easy to put together. Uh, all the all the tunes came quite naturally, and um, that's always you know Terry can probably testify to that. When that happens, it's it's generally it's generally a fun set to play. Uh, when it's effortless to put together, you're not trying to you know fit a square peg into a round hole. Um, I love I love the opening tune in it. 
Um, it's just such a natural, such a natural intro to a medley. It's just so easy, easy on the ear and easy to play. I found throughout the whole medley there was like, like deliberate and definite areas of light and shade that came through. It was almost like the whole thing was orchestral to me. And I don't know if you have that in mind when you're putting it together with Stuart, but does, does anything like that come into play when you're putting these medleys together? Like we want to present a real ensemble thing or we want to highlight drums or pipes or whatever? Um, yeah, I mean, some sometimes, you know, Andrew Douglas was a big part of arranging uh, the ending of that medley, the second half of it. He's very rhythmically driven, um, which makes it easy makes it easy for a drummer then to write scores to that that kind of music it's just you know trying out for for good drumming effects and um so i think that i think the drumming was kind of at the forefront in the second half of it um the first half is just great traditional tunes i think that every everybody knows or has heard at some point and you, you know you're just Trying to bring the music out that's natural to bring out in them. You're not you're not trying to over over force the issue because you don't need to. I know I know you're not a, you know a real big champion of the circle thing, but how come do your tenor drummers face the the drum core or do they face the pipe core? Uh, face the pipe core. And why is that? Why do some bands do it the other way? I think all our bands face the drum core because. The drumming judge then gets the best, the best sound off the drums off the off the front. Um, I think I think the ensemble, you know, the ensemble result is much more powerful than the drumming result at the end of the day if things are all even. Yeah. So I would take the, I would take the ensemble first over the drumming first any day of the week. If they had a sash for ensemble, you'd have won quite a few of them. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen, I would say. Terry. Yes, Stephen, a couple of great things about this performance. One, it, most of the photography is from the back. So the drum corps is very much featured here. The wind noise is kind of a bonus. It's a, it's a, it's a real recording. Uh, it opens with the fabulous tune, Father John McMillan of Vera. Swingy march, just hard to beat. Fantastic. Uh, as I said to Stuart recently, who knows how long you will be world champions. That was the world championship win for you last year and with world events right now maybe you'll be world champions for a while yet to come we'll see what's coming in the future here um thank you so much for doing this today appreciate it thanks to both of you um we're going to be coming back and moving to houston texas next so hope you all enjoyed it out there and uh thanks again to our friends here Bye cheers Stephen. Thanks, Neil. Thanks, Derek.